And out of those Lego bricks, you can assemble a variety of different shapes. So an organic chemist does exactly the same thing. But instead of using Lego bricks of different shapes and sizes and colours, we would use atoms of different shapes and sizes and colours or vibrational qualities. It's, it's what you, you think of a colour of an atom as just it's the way it vibrates kind of thing. So out of that, we would assemble a whole variety of different shapes. And all of you have probably ingested some of those shapes. They end up as the drugs that you take. And so every single tablet you ever take in your life was assembled by an organic chemist. So that's pretty much what I did. And it was like, I really enjoyed it. It was really, it was an exact science, which I loved. I loved the building. And it was artistic because you have a target. Here's a shape like that chandelier. Uh, and say, so you need to make that as cost effective as possible when you're sitting working out to stick that. And so it was fascinating. But what really interested me more was what happens when you test the drugs. Because you have to prove that they work. And there is only one way to prove that a drug works, and that's to give it to people. So you give it to, let's say, 100 people, and then, let's say, my main field was cardiovascular medicine. We got cancer as well, but predominantly cardiovascular. And let's say a typical trial on drugs that I was involved in, let's say 100 people get the drug, uh, then you, uh, maybe you would get 75 people would improve or make a, a measurable improvement, and that's fairly good. But then you've got to give another 100 people a fake drug, the placebo, the sugar pill. And that pretty much is just a sugar pill. It's made of sugar and chalk, really, a blackboard chalk, ultimately. And, and so that's not supposed to heal. But amazingly, what you tend to get, if 75 improve on the drug, quite often you'll get anything from 40, 50, 60, 70, 74, 75, 76 even sometimes, improving on the placebo, for no reason other than they think they're getting drunk. And I thought that was amazing. I remember saying to my colleagues, isn't that fascinating? How many people are improving on the drug? And they say, ah, they're not. it's just the placebo effect. And they'd always the sweeping movement with the right hand. It's like just the placebo effect. And even if they were left-handers, they still did it. You learn it actually in your first week. It's the part of the induction. You know, and, and I couldn't let it lie. So I thought, well, that's fascinating. And, and that I remember asking one of the most senior scientists, but look at the results. There's a physical change. Ah, oh, that's not. They, they're not really getting better. They just think they're getting better. And that's completely wrong. Completely wrong. Because uh, now we understand that there's no such thing as just thinking they're getting better. In actual fact, uh, when you believe something, what you believe causes a physical change in your brain. So the chemicals in your brain literally fiddle about and fly, fly around in response to what you believe. You know, I remember at the time researching these statistics because I was mostly cardiovascular medicine. One of the biggest selling cardiovascular drugs at that time was one of the precursors to what you, to the statins you have today. It's one of the earlier different type but similar in, in one kind of respect, and it's called clofibrate. And it, it had a five year survival. It was a blockbuster, like a billion. A blockbuster is a billion dollar cell, right? It's a billion dollar uh, drug. And it had a five year survival rate for heart patients of 80%. The placebo was 79.1. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 79.1. Now, it didn't mean, of course, that you couldn't get a drug like that on the market now, it wouldn't be allowed. But here's the thing it's not because the drug doesn't work. Because of course it does organic chemists that we build them to order you and know exactly how that they work. But what happens is a person's belief about the drug produces so much of your own biology and your own chemistry that it can amplify the placebo effect so much it can almost rival the drug in many cases. So sometimes uh, pharmaceutical companies struggle to get drugs in the market not because they don't work but because the placebo effect is so high. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing for the mind-body connection, isn't it? Yeah. That's incredible uh, that we're now understanding there is such a thing uh, as a mind-body connection. Before I get into the science of self-esteem, I bet everyone here has experienced their own placebo effect, but you didn't know it at the time. Hands up if you've ever taken aspirin, paracetamol, or ibuprofen. Right, so you will have experienced the placebo effect. I'm not suggesting the drugs don't work, of course they do. But here's the thing, if you want a cupboard and, and take it because it's in your cupboard, or you buy it from a shop, that tells me one extremely important thing. You must believe in it. Otherwise, why on earth would you take it? The believing in it actually amplifies its effectiveness. It lifts it up a wee bit. For example, you can go into Tesco and buy 
paracetamol for what, 15 pence or ibuprofen for what, 23 pence, something like that. Or you can buy Panadol for £1.50 or Nurofen for £2.50 or £4.60 at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> now most people know that paracetamol and Panadol are the exact same thing. You have to be legally, it's exactly the same active ingredient. Most people know that Nurofen and Ibuprofen are the exact same thing, but here's the thing. Uh, Panadol is about 25% better than paracetamol for most people. Similarly, Nurofen is about 25% better than ibuprofen for most people. And you think, well, how? It's the same drug. Any ideas why it's? It's ten times price. Because we've got a wee story in our heads, and the story goes something like this. Well, if it's more expensive, it must be better. Must be. We've heard it so many times in our lives, it's ingrained in our psyche. We've also had the direct experience of spending an extra five or ten pounds for like a better pair of shoes and you get more wear out of them or a better jacket and you get you know more wear out of it or a better haircut and my mum cuts my hair but those of you who pay for your haircuts we've all spent an extra ten or to get a better quality haircut so ingrained in the human psyche is this idea that if it's more expensive it must be better but that belief itself actually lifts up the power of the drug and you're not just thinking you're getting better because it's a more expensive drug research shows that what actually happens is because you believe something like that, your brain produces its own morphine. See, morphine is an opiate drug, but the brain has natural opiates and they're called endogenous opiates. Meaning endogenous means your own, they belong to you, they're endogenous to the body. And endogenous opiates get produced by your brain simply because you believe that such and such a thing will help you. Over and above the power, the drug works of course, but believing in it, or if a doctor showed you, if a doctor showed you really high empathy, and say, look, oh, I understand you, yeah, well, you've had a really bad day, honestly, I think you'll be fine. See if you take the paracetamol, honestly, you'll be fine. The doctor shows you empathy, reassurance, and you walk away, and simply because you feel differently and believe in the doctor, you trust the doctor, your brain squirts its own morphine. Your brain actually produces morphine. We know that from MRI scans. The brain literally produces its own biology in response to what you believe. It's fascinating. I love this kind of stuff. A similar thing happens with Viagra, incidentally. I'm not asking. <laughs> <laughs> I am not asking for a show of hands. <laughs> well, we are. Uh, sorry. <laughs> As a wee side effect, one of the one of the factors that uh, that causes that amplifies the power of the drug Viagra. It's, uh, the drug's called sildenafil. It is a cardiovascular drug, incidentally. Uh, women get it, but they don't know it's Viagra. <laughs> it's sildenafil. It's got another trait. I won't going to tell you what the other name is. It is because you'll know it's Viagra. It's a car, but it's a cardiovascular drug, and it works. It was designed as a cardiovascular drug. It, it dilates arteries, but in males it dilates one artery in particular. <laughs> but anyway, that's beside the point. But one of the factors that amplify the power of the drug Viagra is its name, because it's called Viagra. And that taps into a curious little process in the brain regarding how the brain stores memories. Now memory is actually one of my closet areas of expertise. Uh, about, this? about 25 years ago, I unofficially held a memory world record for about a week uh, for memorizing the order of a deck of cards in one minute and 57 seconds uh, after eight cans of Hamden Lager. <laughs> 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 the Hamden Lager is important in this story. Because one of the ways, I, I, I teach this memory system <coughs> once or twice a year, it's, it's actually astonishingly simple. There is a little process by which playing cards and numbers can be translated, a little code for doing it, that translates them into objects. And all you really have to do is weave 52 objects into a story. Now, who can't make up a story when you've had eight cans of hand? <laughs> <laughs> it's surprisingly easy. So all you really have to do is remember your own story. So it's easy to remember. And if you practice it, it's quite so that the memory systems are actually really easy, there's nothing fancy. But here is how this relates to Viagra. The way these systems work is if you can join two things together in a story, you remember the story. The reason why you remember the story is because in the brain that links two centers of the brain, temp they temporarily wire together, but enough that it's strong enough. Similarly, if two things sound the same, the exact same thing happens. Cat mat. Bat sat. You know, any two things that sound the same have the same neurological connection as two things joined together in a story. So what you have then, it's like a piece of elastic. If you take two things and stretch them apart, and I would hold my piece of elastic, if someone had to ping my hand, then the elastic connected to that hand would, would ping that hand as well. 
So in the brain, if two things are connected, when you think of one, it powers the other one. So think of, not by accident, Viagra happens to sound like Niagara. Niagara Falls. Now think of what, now if Viagra and the Niagara Falls are connected, and think of what the Niagara Falls represents to people. <laughs> it's a force of nature. It's huge, it's a force of nature. It's also straight curve at the top. Anyway, <laughs> I think you understand there's a lot of symbolism in all of this, right? Uh, but because that is connected by sound, whether conscious or unconscious, doesn't matter. Uh, when a person takes Viagra, because it's connected to the sound of what Niagara represents, it kind of pings it. And so that amplifies the power of the drug by manufacturing your own brain chemistry. And so, think about it. Do you think it would be as powerful a drug if it was called Floxy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would still work. It would still work. You have the organic chemists very proud of themselves for building Sildenafil, but calling it Viagra because your perception of what that represents produces enough of your own brain chemistry to increase the effect. You don't just think. You get your, it's working, it is actually makes it physically different because you, your perception fiddles about with your brain chemistry. Similarly, your perception of what that other thing represents also fiddles about with your brain chemistry and negates some of the effect of the drug. So there. Yeah. So I thought I'd just give you a wee kind of intro before we get into the science of self-esteem so that you, you almost understand my take on this subject of self-esteem. You probably wouldn't notice it uh, by listening to me, but I totally struggled with self-esteem for years and just kind of got by without, you know, without anyone noticing. And I mean, it's, a, it's amazing how you can get by without people really knowing what's going on in your life. And it came to a head for me. I was standing at the side of the stage at the SECC in Glasgow and it was a big personal development conference. And I was the next speaker on after the late Dr. Wayne Dyer, who passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, and Wayne was getting a standing ovation to about an audience of about a thousand people. And I was in the wings of the stage and I was next one. And I had an anxiety attack. And it wasn't because I was nervous. I wasn't nervous about speaking. I'd done it, you know, I'd spoken enough times to audiences that you kind of get used to it. It doesn't, you don't get used to it that you're not nervous. You always get that a little bit. But you just kind of get used to feeling that way so you don't really notice it, so to speak. But this was different. It was like an anxiety attack that came from a really deep space of, I'm just not worthy. It's not good enough. And as odd as it might sound, it, I, I, it was like a voice in my head. It wasn't a real voice, but if I could put into words the sentiment that I was feeling at that time, it was, who do you think you are? You're from Bannock. Anyone know Bannock, by the way? It's near Bonnie Bridge out towards Cumbernauld on the way to Glasgow, yeah. Um, Tiny bean village, it's like that size. It's not actually that size. You know. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's very small, very small population. We've got like a post office and a co-op and a petrol station and that's pretty, and a hairdresser's and a Chinese and but that's pretty much it. There's nothing else in Bangkok except for houses. And, uh, and it was like this, the sentiment I was feeling at that time was, who do you think you are? Are you from Bangkok? People from Bangkok from Scotland. Don't go on after Wayne Dyer and all these Americans who've all pretty much been on Oprah. Because <laughs> they were all, it was a Hay House event, and the only way Hay House can sell out big events like that is to bring Americans over and pay them an absolute share of the money to get them to come over. So Wayne Dyer was there, Louise Hay was there, Cheryl Richardson was there, Brian Weiss was there, Greg Braden was there. A lot of big heavy hitters who'd sell thousands and thousands, who'd sold millions of books. And me. And Kyle Gray as well, you probably know Kyle Gray. Yeah. I think me and Kyle were the soul, the, the, the double, double act of Scottish people. <laughs> and uh, Kyle was on the next day. But, uh, but, so I was the sole Scots person on that day. And it was almost this wee voice saying, you're from Scotland, you don't do events like that. Let these important people have their day. You know, you're shit, get you know? on. <laughs> but that's how I felt. And it wasn't, I wasn't nervous about speaking. It was that feeling was, had literally bubbled up from I don't know where at the time so strongly that all I wanted to do was grab hold of the cotton line and fall and have a cry. And if it wasn't for the fact, I, I was that close to the runner. <laughs> I, was, I was that close. I, you know, when you're feeling, when emotions take over, you don't really see the world clearly, do you? And you, you don't really feel, you don't perceive things. You can be irrational. And I was that close to legging it, really. And, and wouldn't have thought that that was wrong at the time. 
And I just felt it was like an anxiety attack, but I just felt like I'm just not good enough. I can't do this. You know, I'm just not good enough, really. That's me. And as odd as it might sound, uh, I got a memory flashback of a time when I was about five or six years old, standing in the corner at school because I hadn't brought in money for a school trip. And the, the reason I didn't bring in money for the school trip is because my mum and dad were really poor. They were really struggling. My dad used to get made redundant all the time. My dad started off as a miner, and then he started working in a building site. You know what the building site was like? The building trade slows down at Christmas, winter time. A lot of casual workers like my dad, when I was a kid, got laid off and then hired again in February or end of January. So my mum, every year, was taking payday loans for, to cover the Christmas presents. Uh, and then she was getting into so much debt, and I heard my mum and dad arguing one night, and I nipped downstairs, and my mum was crying. And so upset, oh, what do you do? It's coming to Christmas, and you don't have any money for presents, and less than you do a jacket for school, and what? And my mum was so upset, I ran up to my bed, clapped, crying my eyes out, one out of empathy for my mum. And secondly, I felt that ashamed of myself, because when my mum's got money, the first thing she does is spend it on the family. Still does it. My mum won, like, £50 in the bingo. A couple of weeks ago, and she gave us a fiver. I'm <laughs> 48, you know. <laughs> but it's so nice. It's my mum. She's, she's the kindest person. She's my role model for kindness. And, uh, and it was just, it was amazing. That, that's a, it is still amazing, my mum. It's like that. But I felt so selfish in that moment. I think my mum would give you the shirt off her back. My mum would do anything for the family. Always kind. And at that time, lying in my bed crying, after hearing my mum crying, all I could think of was how selfish I am. Because whenever I get money, my mum, whenever my mum get money, she would spend it on the family, take it out, do something. But if I got money, the first thing I did, over at the shop, and I spent it all myself in sweets. And that's, that's only what a kid does. But at that time, I was just feeling so, you know, sad for my mum and, and ashamed of my own self. So I didn't ask my mum for the money for the school trip because I knew the teacher had asked us to bring in, I think it was 10 pence, 5 pence, I, this was 1976, so probably 5 or 10 pence, for a, probably a token gesture for the school trip, I don't know. But I didn't ask my mum for the money because I, I knew my mum and dad were struggling. Now, if, as a six, 5 or 6 year old kid, you don't understand the value of money. So I could have, 5 or 10 pence, that for me could have been a week's wages or a, a week's dinners, I, I didn't really know. I just knew that I couldn't possibly take money off my mum, given that she's so upset about money. So I didn't, I was the only kid in the school that didn't, the class that didn't bring the money in, and the teacher didn't take it very well at all. I think, to be honest, to be fair, she was probably just a young girl straight out of teaching college with no experience of teaching at all, because she really didn't last very long. She was, I, I think she was only our teacher for a very small, but at times she probably got complaints or something, I don't know. But she made she said something like, Well, David Hamilton isn't good enough to bring his money in and he can stay here and we'll all go on the school trip and uh, and he can wait until we come back. And then she made me stand in the corner and I remember this was a flashback of what the teacher saying that if David Hamilton isn't good enough. And then I'm standing in the corner like that, looking round to the rest of the class are parading out to the front and the teacher is giving them a reward for bringing the money in it's a yellow badge and it's I don't remember the details partly because I didn't get one but it was like a smiley face or a sunflower or a sun but it was yellow now I didn't really care about the school trip I'd never been in one didn't know what a school trip was so it wasn't really a big deal to be honest but the badge is gutted because <laughs> see when you're a kid you only get a badge on a special day don't you when it's your birthday so the badge for me symbolised the special. So what did my, my five or my six year old brain pick up in that day? Everyone in the class is special except for me. And it's funny how ideas get in your head and you have similar reinforcing concepts and then it kind of echoes through your life. And when I say echo, you know if you take a, a, a pebble and you chuck it in the water, it goes chum, 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 and it echoes kind of thing. Then you get a kind of echo in your life or a repeat, people call it a repeating pattern, where the same sets of circumstances repeat themselves. And for me, the pattern that repeated itself really through my teenage years and through my early adult years, and really up until I, I started dealing with this and wrote my book on it, was that everyone else is special except for me, and I need to prove myself. And so I used to, I got a reputation at school for being a big head, a boaster. And it really, it was, I was trying to give people reasons to like me. So 
So I was trying to achieve everything just so that I could tell people about it. And then the dust would settle and people would forget about it. And I'd achieve something else and tell them about that instead. And then the dust would settle and, and, and people don't know. People are not talking about that anymore. I need to achieve something else and something else. And so I got this reputation. I got bullied horrendously when I got to 60. It was equivalent of cyberbullying, what you get now on the internet. But this was before the internet. It was 1987, 88, 60 at school and the posters around the school with you know, a photograph of me trying to dance at a school disco with a Polaroid. What's Hammy doing now? You know, Hammy is a prick, Hammy is a dick, and we've been kicked Hammy's in kind of thing. It was all, it was, that was my typical day actually at high school in my sixth year. Uh, and, but what you didn't realise is what, what I was trying to do was get people to like me because I felt like everyone else has got something without, except for me. And it wasn't a conscious thought. When stuff gets buried so deep inside, you don't, you're not conscious of it, you just act out the pattern. So when you clock forward, here I am at the side of the stage, and that's what I remember. <laughs> you ever notice, memory, memory works by association, this is part of how the memory system works, that you tend to remember, at certain emotional times, you tend to remember other times when you felt the exact same way. You ever notice that? But if you're feeling, sad or depressed, it's very difficult to remember positive things. It's a good strategy if you can get your mind to do it, but it's hard to do initially unless you're trained in it. Similar, if you're feeling great, you tend not to remember the times when you felt shit. So the memory, memory works by association. You tend to associate, remember other times you felt something similar. So what my brain was doing at that point is I was remembering back to a time I'm standing at the side of the stage feeling I'm not good enough, and I'm remembering back to a time when that first Consciously remember feeling that way, that I'm not good enough. So what my six-year-old brain was processing that day was all the other speakers were special, except for me. And it was almost like the other speakers had a yellow badge, and I didn't have one. And that's why I took the anxiety attack. It wasn't because I was nervous. It was simply because I felt so deeply, deeply that I'm not good enough. And you, you probably noticed that most adults, if you put them under enough pressure or stress, act like children. And that's because most of the, the, most of the wiring in the brain and the blend of brain chemicals associated with how you feel about yourself and your position in the world and how you manage stress, most of that's laid down in the first six or seven years of your life. Uh, so what happens is we end up playing out childhood patterns as adults. You can see it. Right, most, most people probably... In fact, all of us, you know, if we're being really honest, play out our childhood ways of dealing with things because that's what we know. Unless you, you find different ways of, of tweaking that as an adult, which is easier than you think I'll teach you one tonight. Uh, but typically that's what we do. And so in my experience at the side of the stage was that. And that was the day I thought I have to deal with this because I've been struggling with that deep feeling of not good enough privately for years. At the time I'd written seven books. And it's amazing, that's why I said to you, it's funny how you can get by in life without people really knowing what's going on in your life. And people, I thought, people must have seen me in stage and all think, he's really got everything together. When I'm talking, yeah, I'm in the zone and I know my stuff. You know, I research tons and tons of stuff. But nobody knew what was actually privately going on in my, my mind, in my life, what I was privately struggling with. And I thought, it's, it's coming to a head now. It's interfering with every important area of my life, catastrophically in some respects, and I decided I need to sort it out now, and that's the day I decided to research the science of self-esteem. And, uh, and it's funny because I had a few significant breakthroughs, and I want to share a couple with you tonight. The first significant breakthrough came because I like to science things up. <laughs> it's just my thing, you know. When you're a trained scientist, you can't help bringing science to the stuff, and I know a lot about the brain and neuroscience and stuff. And one of the things that I knew about was kind of what I talked about at the start here. When you feel something or believe something, that feeling or belief feeds back into the body and has an effect on the body. Right? So what you think and feel physically affects the body. But what also happens, and you probably don't notice, is it goes the other way as well. It's called bidirectional. What you do with your body also feeds back in and affects the brain. For example, if you feel really happy about something, what happens to your face? 
It's my way. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Do you remember to smile, is it, or, or is it just happened by itself? It happens by itself. Eh? It's a reflex reaction. So when you when you feel really happy, you don't go, oh, I'm feeling amazing. What was I doing my face again? Oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> it's a reflex reaction because it's almost as if it's almost like a puppet on a string type thing. It's almost as if the positive emotional centres or circuitry of the brain is almost like they're tugging this muscle here. This muscle is called your zygomaticus major. It's the muscle that pulls your lips into a smile. There's also a muscle at the side of your eyes called your orbicularis oculi. And that, these are the two predominant smile muscles. So they are, it's almost like a puppet on a string. You feel happy about something, and the brain centres for positive emotion lift up these muscles. And so what happens is how you feel is now being projected onto your body. So your body is physically responding to how you feel. Right? But what I mean by bidirectional is it goes the other way as well. In fact, before I say that, similarly, when you feel really stressed, you don't also say, <clears throat> do you know what, I'm feeling really stressed at the moment. What is it you do again? Oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember to do that. It's a reflex reaction. Again, it's like a puppet on the string. This muscle here called your corrugator supercellia. I love to say that. <laughs> corrugator supercellia. Uh, and, and it, it's like a puppet on a string again, but now it's the negative emotional circuitry of the brain that's tugging on this muscle, tightening your jaw, it's tightening your neck and your shoulders and your stomach's like a washboard. And you're not remembering to do all that. It's a reflex reaction because how you feel is immediately projected out onto your physical body. So what does bidirectional mean? It goes both ways. What you do with your physical body feeds back into the brain with exactly the same weight, meaning exactly the same power. So to the degree that a reflex reaction of, I feel happy makes me smile, to the same degree of <coughs> power and strength, if you adjust your physical body, it feeds back into the brain and fiddles about with your brain chemistry enough that it affects how you feel. For example, the fastest way to get stressed, if this was your goal, I'm presuming it's not, but let's say for argument's sake that your goal was to get stressed. The quickest way to do that, outside of suddenly remembering a very traumatic event, outside of that, the fastest way to consciously do it is to move your body in a really stressed way. So if I wanted to get stressed really quickly, I would, I would go like that. And then I start breathing fast, and then I start moving my body in really jerky movements like that. And I move around really kind of fast. And if you had to take saliva and blood samples, you would see stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine, going through the roof within seconds. Because the loudest voice your brain hears, the loudest voice your brain hears isn't the words that you say or the thoughts that you think. The loudest voice, metaphorically speaking, the loudest voice your brain hears is how you hold and move your body. The reason for that is language is very recent. Now in the entire recorded history of the human species, language is, God, it's what, 15,000 years old, give or take, a couple of days. <laughs> it's relatively recent. Now for millions of years of evolution prior to that, how did our ancient ancestors communicate with one another? Facial expressions and body language and gesture. So millions of years of evolution has ingrained into us an, a complete implicit understanding of what that means and, and what any body language means. And this is why uh, research shows that 60 to 90 percent of the emotional content that your brain processes in any conversation is not what the person says. It's how they convey it with their facial expressions and their body language. It's called non-verbal communication. 60 to 90% of the data your brain processes is these non-verbal gestures, facial expressions, breathing patterns, where your shoulders are, whether your shoulders are here or here, whether you're standing upright or slouching, whether you're speaking slow or fast, whether your zygomatic is major, even whether, whether you say something untrue. And within 15 thousandths of a second, your face will flush. And no one can prevent that, unless you're a psychopath. No one, no one can tell a lie without a 15 one thousandth of a second flush in your face. Right? You can slow video cameras down and you can see incongruency when someone says something that's false and you get a tiny, tiny little opening of a blood vessel, tiny, tiny little flash of colour appearing so rapidly, 15 one thousandths of a second, your eye can't pick it up, your brain does. 
the brain processes it. So for millions of years of evolution, our ancestors communicated through body language and gesture. So this is why I say the loudest voice your brain hears isn't what you say or what you think, it's how you hold and move your body. So that's why the fastest way to get stressed is move your body in a stressed way. But also, the quickest way to relax is maybe counterintuitive. Because if you're feeling really stressed, what's the first thing we all do? We sit down, eh? You sit down and you go, oh, you take a rest. Now that works, of course that works. Of course. But you know, a quicker way to relax is to actually get up. But move your body in a way that your brain hears and interprets as, I've got all the time in the world. So if I'm feeling really stressed and urgent about something, then sitting down and relaxing might take me five or ten minutes of breathing. But I can get there five times faster if I actually get up and artificially move my body really slowly and go as if my, so that my brain hears, I have all the time in the world. And artificially walk at an, at an ins incredibly, stupidly slow pace <laughs> and actually move your limbs intentionally, very slowly. Very slow. Tai Chi does something kind of similar, and one of these side effects is deep relaxation. But move your body extremely slow, and even talk to yourself like a 33 <laughs> RPM record. And if you do all that, and move really slow, rapidly, much faster than sitting down and taking a deep breath, much faster does your body actually go into a state of deeper relaxation. It's incredible, really. And it's, again, it's because the loudest voice your brain hears isn't what you say or how you think. Generally speaking, it's how you hold and move your body. So how does that relate to self-esteem or self-love? Well, if, you're, if a person is struggling with self-love, self-esteem, and I'm going to make an assumption, uh, I guess I have to make a global assumption that people are in the room here, most of you are here because you want to learn something about the science of self-esteem, otherwise, unless some of you are probably just here for a wee bit of science, or, who this guy is that talks about this kind of stuff out of curiosity. But I, I, I'd hazard a guess that 80 90 percent of people here are here because you want to learn about yeah, self esteem. So I'll make that assumption, and therefore you probably know what I'm talking about. That in, it's in particular situations where the issues with self esteem or self love or self compassion even come to the surface, and you wear it on your face and on your body, don't you? For example, if you're feeling you enter an environment and you don't feel good enough, you probably notice, if you were aware of it, you probably don't notice it. You probably don't notice, but if you were aware of it, you'd probably find that your shoulders will turn in, like that. Whereas normally, in, a, in good company, around family and friends, people you feel safe around, you'll probably find your shoulders more relaxed and your spine is more straight. But in this environment, that you're feeling a bit kind of self-conscious, you're more kind of rounded and you're also sitting a wee bit like that, you're kind of slumped a wee bit like that, and you'll probably find that your chin is down and your eyes move around a bit quicker. It's almost like subconsciously your body is saying, I'm not really sure here in this environment, and you'll find, if you slow a video camera down, you'll find that your face and your joints move really fast. You wouldn't notice it unless you slowed it right down. But if you slowed the camera right down, you'd notice that your body's vibrating a bit. You don't notice it, it's very subtle. You really have to know what you're looking for, but you pretty much do that and you're looking at like that. Whereas if someone's really present, completely balanced in themselves, and you slow the camera down, totally still. You see, and, and celebrities have been around for a long time, and then you look at a video, I've I did this on YouTube, I've picked up videos of some very well-known celebrities like 25 years ago, being interviewed, and they're talking faster and they're not sure of themselves and 25 years later they're totally sound, totally centered, completely calm, relaxed, not a movement, completely still, eyes are totally on the person at that particular time. And so how you feel is projected on your body. So if you're struggling with self-esteem, then any particular environment you'll wear that on your face and also on your body. You don't mean to. I, I know exactly what it's like. I struggled with for years. I used to avoid something that's going to offer functions because I was scared to death of talking to Wayne Garrett, because he was my hero. 
I was scared to death of talking to other office. I'd make an excuse for either not going or finding someone I knew that I could come in with or pretending that I've got all this important emails and stuff to do. And I'm really, the screen's blank and I'm just reading something and pretending that I'm working because I was so nervous. And, uh, and so different environments, we've all got our own stuff. And we all know what the, the environments we're talking about privately to us, but you wear it on your body. But here's the thing, if you train yourself to adjust your posture, and wear on your body, I have an inner sense of worthiness and value. And train your body to do that, then that will start to feed back into the brain and affect how you feel. Because when you're feeling in that particular way, your body is reacting to it like that. And I'll exaggerate just for, so that you can clearly see. Your body's reacting, it's almost making itself smaller. But if you were to do that, and practice doing that, then your body would feed back into the brain, and your brain would start to feel congruent with how your body is acting. And it works astonishingly fast. 